If you clicked on this video, you either want to know the quick answer to the question posed in the title, or you're interested in what the process of buying a resale flat in Singapore is like, or both. In that case, the short answer is this. I bypassed the restriction of needing to be 35 years old to buy a HDB in Singapore as a single person by forming a family nucleus with my mother. Even though my mother is not a Singapore citizen, we qualified under the non-citizen family scheme and under that scheme, we were eligible to buy a HDB resale flat. I was able to pay for the house because I had a lot of savings from my father's CPF, my own savings and with my mother's and my brother's savings as well. Even though I did write to my MP and also HDB to appeal for financial assistance or to make some kind of special exception for me, I did not receive any help in the end. I did not receive any money from HDB. No singles grant, no proximity housing grants, no CPF grants, nothing. If that's all you wanted to know and that answered your question, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I make a lot of personal finance and HDB resale flat content like this and I hope to see you in my next video. But if you're interested in hearing the full story, the entire process, down to my own spiraling thoughts and reflections about the whole experience, I really hope you continue watching. You're probably curious or interested in buying a home yourself if you're watching this, so in this video I'll be detailing the exact timeline and breaking down the finances of it as it was for me. And that's an important point, because I doubt that most of you will go through the scheme that I did, or will have the same timeline that I had. I'm not an expert, not a consultant, and this isn't an ultimate guide, but I'll do my best to be helpful and I'll be including links in the description if you need more references. So while this video is not a how-to, I hope it will at least give you an outline of what to expect. Prior to embarking on this house buying journey, I did a lot of research and I also had the help of a real estate agent. For this video, my real estate agent very kindly looked through the timeline and numbers that I outlined to make sure that I was giving correct information about the process and all that. So that is something that I really want to get right and represent as accurately as I can. This will not be just a video about the process and the finances. A big part of why I am making this video is to share and document my story, yes to you but mostly for myself. It's a video I had planned to make when I started this channel. Making this video is a way for me to talk about what I had gone through and put it together into something that is coherent to myself and to others because I believe that it's part of my journey to healing, processing my experience and moving on from it. Having had enough distance now from when it all happened, I hope that this will give me the opportunity to step back and celebrate this achievement because while it was a really difficult time, it also brought great reward when I made it through the other side. You know, I bought a house, a roof over our heads, to support my remaining parent and myself. And also, to any of my friends or acquaintances who are watching, this may or may not be an explanation to why I might have been distant or flaky during that time period, and for that I'm sorry. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I'll round up some life lessons, some valuable and difficult lessons I learned from this house buying experience at the end of this video, so I really hope you'll watch till the end. Not necessarily what I wish I had known before buying a house, but more what I wish I could have told myself had I been there for myself 18 months ago. As always, I will include timestamps in the description and any other helpful links and information. I'll split this story into two major parts. The first part is the background leading up to the start of my journey of buying my HDB flat. I think that this will give some important context for the rest of the story. The second part of the story will begin from September 2020, when I made the decision to move out and find a new place as soon as possible. Let's begin. Part 1 of the story is pretty long and very much focused on my personal life. So please feel free to skip this section if you'd like to get straight into the HDB process. I'll section this story into 9 parts so that there is a structure and timeline that you can follow as I talk about the various events leading up to the start of my journey with buying a house. Let's start. In fact, let's start way back from when I was 12 years old. I grew up in a 3-room HDB flat with both my parents and a younger brother. 
My mother is a non-citizen, but my father is Singaporean, and so is my brother and I. And so the house belongs solely to my father, since non-citizens can't own or co-own a HDB. And when I was 12 years old, my father had to sell the house. We fell into some bad times and things were very difficult for us financially, so he sold the house and the four of us moved in with my father's sister, my aunt. She also lives in a three-room HDB and she lives alone, so the four of us moved into her spare bedroom. My father used the money we got from selling our house to pay off the remainder of my aunt's mortgage on her home. So now there were five of us living in that three-room HDB and this was our new home. Between then and my last year of university, I was just living my life as usual. After junior college and while in university, I did a lot of part-time jobs in FNB. I also received bursaries while I was in university. So during this time, I was pretty much supporting myself in terms of my own personal spending, like clothes, phone bill, school fees and all that. At the same time, I was also able to save quite a bit of money from all my part-time jobs and bursaries from school. In 2019, halfway through my final year of university, my father died. It was sudden and I didn't see it coming. I remember I took a week off from school and that was it. I didn't know how to cope with it, so putting in 110% of my focus on my schoolwork was how I dealt with that. At the same time, I had to deal with all the paperwork that comes with death the closing of bank accounts, the consolidating of possessions. I was sitting in banks a lot, trying to prove my relationship to my father because he didn't have any sort of will or estate planning documents. There was also the matter of his CPF money. My father did not make a CPF nomination before his death, so what happened after he passed was CPF closed his account and all the money from his retirement and Medisafe accounts were automatically transferred to the public trustee's office, which is a government body that administers the estates of deceased persons. Okay, pause this video right now and think if you or your parents have made a CPF nomination. For the sake of your sanity and your family's sanity, I hope that it's an easy decision to make and that you make it as soon as possible. You can do it online on the CPF website, it's very quick, you just need two witnesses and you can do it over the phone, and it's reversible, which means you can always change who you nominate later. Back to the story. My father had about $70,000 in his CPF account that was transferred to the public trustee's office, or PTO for short. I had to write in an application to PTO to request that the money be disbursed to us, and to do that, of course, you have to submit all the documents to prove your family relationship and all that. And then there was another layer to this. Because we're a Muslim family and my father died a Muslim, his assets are bound by Sharia law. I'm not going to go into the details of this law and what it means for Muslim families, but how this law affected us for this particular thing was that it determined how assets are split. Between myself, my mother and my brother, my father's CPF money would be divided among us in certain percentages. To figure out this percentage, I had to go down with my family to the Sharia court in Singapore and have them write us an inheritance certificate, which decided what shares we were each entitled to. And like any patriarchal religion in the world, the male inheritor gets the largest share. For my family, it was split into 24 shares. My brother got 14 shares, I got 7 shares, and my mother got 3 shares. I had to bring this certificate to PTO and they requested individual bank accounts from all of us and we had to prove that they were our bank accounts under our individual names so they were quite strict about releasing the exact amount of funds to whomever it was entitled to in the exact percentage as dictated by the inheritance certificate. And here was the problem. They could not release my brother's funds because he was not yet 21 which is the age of majority. So PTO held back half of my father's money, the 14 shares that belonged to my brother. Between my mother and I, we got about $30,000, while $42,000 was still stuck in PTO, at least until my brother turns 21. Which was okay, fine, I wasn't happy about it, but it's not like we lost the money, it would just take a few years to return to us. And anyway, at the time, we didn't need all that money right away, I was just about to graduate and we were still living at our aunt's place. 
An unpleasant surprise that gave me a lot of angst was learning that my family, my mother, my brother and I, had no legal stake in the house despite the passing of my father, who co-owned the place with my aunt when he was still alive. I mentioned that he paid off the rest of her mortgage previously, and they became co-owners. But there are two kinds of co-ownership. There is joint tenancy and tenancy in common. Joint tenancy is the kind of co-ownership that you would typically see between spouses, where in the case of one spouse's death, the living spouse inherits 100% of the share of the property. Whereas tenancy in common refers to an arrangement where two or more people own definite and separate shares. So you would think that my father and my aunt would have opted for this kind of co-ownership given that they were siblings, not spouses, and that my father had children to inherit his share. But for reasons that remain unknown to me even till today, my father and my aunt chose joint tenancy, which meant that after his death, ownership of the house returned fully to my aunt and my family was left with no legal right over the property. So even though my father had paid for a significant chunk of the house, legally we had no right to ownership. Anyway, time passed and I continued to live my life. I did an internship and in April 2020, I got my first full-time job, just two weeks before the country entered a nationwide lockdown because of the pandemic. My starting salary was $3,000 and I was beyond happy. It felt like so much money and I was also so immensely grateful to have even found a job at a time when many people were losing theirs. Between then and about August 2020, my aunt and I were tentatively talking about the future of the house. She kept saying that she might want to sell the house and downgrade to a smaller two-room, in which case she asked if I would be interested in buying the current three-room that we were staying in. And it was all up in the air. Nothing was really formalized or seriously considered. I knew absolutely nothing at this point about buying a house or eligibility schemes or down payments. I was just a fresh grad starting out her first job while living through a global pandemic. At the same time, I was also struggling really badly with depression and I was on medication, but that is a story for another video. It was around this time that I became really interested in personal finance. I had my own savings and I had this $30,000 from my father's CPF that was just lying around and I knew that there was something else I could be doing with it. So this was the time that I started doing a lot of research on investments and robo-advisors, reading articles on Seedly and SingSaver and all of that. The goal with my father's money at this time was to save and grow that money for future plans to buy a home for my family in the next few years. And because of the conversations with my aunt, I was curious about what exactly the process is like for buying a house and whether or not I could even do it in the first place. So in July 2020, I wrote in an email to HDB to ask about buying a resale flat because at the time, I was only thinking about buying over the flat we were currently staying in from my aunt. Here's a screenshot of HDB's reply. You can pause to read it. Basically, they informed me of the existence of the non-citizen family scheme, which allows me to buy a HDB as a single person below 35 years old by forming a family nucleus with my mother. So this was great news to me. Later in August, after thinking over it for a while, I decided that I didn't want to buy over my aunt's house, I wanted a BTO, since BTOs are way more affordable, and I'd have a much longer lease. So I wrote in again to HDB to ask if I was eligible. Here's the screenshot, pause here to read it in full, but in essence, HDB is a lot more strict with BTOs. Technically, I could form a family nucleus with my mother, but HDB only accepts at minimum, one Singapore citizen and one Singapore PR. And my mother is neither, which makes us not eligible. And there is no sibling scheme either. So that was a huge blow. It was really frustrating because my mother has been here my entire life. And it's not that she's not a PR for lack of trying. We've been applying for PR since forever and we keep getting rejected despite numerous appeals. So it just felt really unfair to me that I could not get access to new and more affordable housing because of this. But wait, it gets worse. At the very beginning of September, I think it was the 1st of September, where the spark was ignited, the catalyst for this entire home buying journey. My aunt told me that everything that we had only been tentatively discussing, all of that was off the table now because she wanted to keep the house. 
which would have been fine, you know, everyone has to take care of themselves first. But what was completely unacceptable to me were the assumptions made about my family. Her reasoning behind not wanting to sell the house, specifically to me and my family, were based on assumptions of character that were frankly insulting and untrue. I won't go into too much detail because this is not that kind of video, but my mother and I did ask, what about the money that my father paid for the mortgage? Doesn't that count for something? But to sum it up, she said something to the effect of, well, your father never helped with any of the utilities, and anyway, he's dead, and in the eyes of the law, the house is legally mine. After the conversation, I went into the bedroom and immediately just looked up property guru and arranged for some house viewings. We've reached the next part of the story. Just like part one, I will chapter this section, so hopefully it'll be easier to follow. So now it's September 2020, and I have made the decision in my heart to move my family out of my aunt's house. My brother at the time had already moved out into another relative's place who had a spare bedroom, which was fine anyway because even with my father gone, three grown-up people in one bedroom was really difficult. My brother was actually just sleeping in the living room while my mother and I slept in the bedroom. So at the time, it was only my mother and I living in that house with my aunt. So after that conversation in that first week of September, I consolidated my family's entire wealth, uh, whatever we had in wherever places. I abandoned any and all previous plans, like my initial plans to invest my father's money. Here's what my financial situation was like at that exact point in time. As of September 2020, I had about $54,000 in cash and $4,000 in my CPF. This $54,000 comprised $25,000 of my father's money that had been released to us by PTO, $15,200 of my life savings, and $13,800 of my student loan money saved up that I haven't fully repaid. At this time, my salary was $3,000, and from September onwards, I started putting aside between $1,000 to $1,500 into my house fund. My expenses at this time were very low, I had no insurance, I was paying about $300 in utilities for my aunt's house. My income increased to $3,200 in October 2020, so that also helped to increase my savings amount. Fast forward to end November 2020. I managed to save up $70,500 in cash and $7,000 in my CPF, making it a total of $77,500. The breakdown of this cash portion looks like this. There is the original 54k, uh, $4,500 extra accumulated savings, $8,000 from my brother, $4,000 from my mother. My brother and my mother's contributions were a huge help and I'm so grateful that we even had the reserve of savings to tap into when we really needed it. Alongside consolidating my finances, which is a step that you cannot skip, I also did so much research. Here are some examples of the articles I read from Blue Nest, The Smart Local, and even the HDB website itself. I recommend you check out all these articles if you are doing your own serious research to buy a resale flat. I'll make sure to link all of them in the description below, so check out the description box. From my research, I got a sense of HDB's process of buying a resale HDB, all the steps involved, and the considerations to make. I won't go into detail about those considerations like looking into the neighbourhoods or amenities because this video is more so focused on the process. But there are so many articles that discuss this topic in depth and I really recommend that you read up on that also. On the 3rd of September, I had my first phone call with my real estate agent. My financial advisor, who is also my friend, introduced me to him. His name is Finn and I'll link his website in the description. We had really good rapport and I told him about my situation and he told me all the services that he offers as a real estate agent. And after discussing it with my mum, we decided to work with him or generally just work with an agent. I know some people would think that hiring an agent is unnecessary and that it's totally possible to complete this entire process on your own. It might even save you some money if you're a good negotiator. My reasoning behind engaging the services of a real estate agent was quite simple. 
I was out of my depth. I was stressed out. I had a full-time job to do. I was living in a toxic environment. I was really overwhelmed and depressed. And my mother was going through the same thing. I simply did not have the capacity to do everything myself just to save a few thousand dollars in agent fees. And that is something to consider for you as well. Don't forget to take into account your time and your energy because that is also a cost that you pay. So based on my research and my conversation with my agent, here is an outline of the steps in the process of buying a resale HDB. On the 7th of September, I made the first formal step in this home buying process. I registered my intent to buy on the HDB portal. You can do this for free on the HDB website and what this does is that HDB gives you an instant assessment of your eligibility to buy a resale flat as well as your eligibility for housing grants and HDB housing loan. So when I registered my intent to buy, I realized that while I was eligible to buy a flat, I was not eligible for any grants. At this point, I wrote in an appeal to HDB as well as my MP. At the same time, the HDB portal also guides you to apply for your HDB loan eligibility or HLE letter if you're eligible for and intend to get a housing loan from HDB. You must have a valid HLE letter when the sellers grant you the OTP, which I will explain later. There is a different but similar process if you're looking at a bank loan, but I'll talk about HDB loan specifically because that's what I chose to go with for the practical and simple reason that HDB loans give a larger loan-to-value ratio compared to bank loans. Let's backtrack a little. Most people have to take some kind of loan when purchasing a house because most people don't have that kind of money up front to pay for a house. This loan is called a mortgage. You can take this loan from a bank, or in most cases for HDB flats, you can take this loan from HDB. The loan amount, the sum of money that the bank or HDB is willing to loan to you, is dependent on two things. Your mortgage servicing ratio, or MSR, and your loan-to-value ratio. What is MSR? On the MAS website, it is defined as the portion of a borrower's gross monthly income that goes towards repaying all property loans, including the loan being applied for. MSR is kept at 30% of a borrower's gross monthly income. To put it simply, your current income influences your loan amount because obviously your income reflects your purchasing power and therefore repaying ability. But it's not as straightforward as calculating 30% of your income times however many years HDB has their own calculator that you can use because they have their own formula on how they calculate the loan amount for which you are eligible. So please refer to the calculator that is on their website. The second factor that influences your loan amount is the loan-to-value ratio. This LTV ratio is in turn most commonly affected by two sub-factors, the valuation of your property and the remaining lease on your property. For HDB loans, the maximum LTV ratio is 90% at the time I applied. If you've heard about the cooling measures in 2021, that ratio has been reduced to 85%, but during my time, it was at its maximum of 90%. It's really quite complicated, so I won't go into detail in this video, but if you'd like a comprehensive breakdown of this, Please read this article on Property Guru. They go into way more detail about what affects your LTV. So on 7th September, I registered my intent to buy and applied for my HLE. My HLE got approved on the 10th of September, three days later. Here's a look at my HLE letter. As you can see, HDB offers three scenarios from shortest term of 15 years to the longest of 25 years. Basically, the longer your term, the bigger your loan, which means you get more money, but ultimately you pay more interest. If you look at this line here about the flat's remaining lease, this was what I was referring to earlier about the LTV. Anyway, I knew that I'll have to take the longest term possible because I needed as much money as I could get in order to finance the house. So these were the first two crucial steps in setting up my entire journey of buying a house. You need to figure out your finances, and to do that, you need to register your intent to buy because that will tell you if you're eligible for any grants and also apply for your HLE letter so you know what loan amount you have to work with. 
I mentioned that when I did my intent to buy, it showed me that I was not eligible for any grants, and so I wrote in an appeal to HDB and my MP, essentially requesting that I be eligible for this free money. At the same time, I also wrote in an appeal to the public trustee's office to request my brother's share of my father's CPF money that is currently locked in PTO until my brother reaches the age of majority. If you remember from part one of this story, there is about $42,000 that is allocated as my brother's share, and at that point he still wasn't 21 yet, and so none of us, neither my brother nor my family, could get that money out. My plan from the very beginning, since I made the intention to buy a house, was to get a three-room HDB flat. It was logical that our three of us, myself, my brother and my mother, I figured I could share a room with my mother, and if my brother decided to stay on campus during his university studies, either my mother or I could sleep in his room. I thought about getting a four-room, but given our finances, I thought it has to be a three-room at least. And you see my loan amount, right? It's at maximum $198,300. And the average market price of three-room HDB resale flats were anywhere between three hundred k to four hundred k Even if I was looking for something on the lower end of the scale, say three hundred k I still had to fork out about $102k. I had like $58,000 in total, including CPF. There was just this huge gap that I could not cover, at least not in the short term. And so it was imperative that I made the case to PTO and appealed for the early release of that money to bridge this gap and give me a chance at financing the purchase of at least a three-room HDB flat. So I wrote in an email and I also made some calls. I was optimistic because how can they say no, right? On 17 September 2020, PTO called me back to say that they cannot release my brother's money and the situation we were in did not call for an exception to be made. They gave an immovable no, essentially. I just called my agent and said, let's look for a two-room from now on. Six days later, on the 23rd of September, HDB replied my email to say that my appeal for CPF housing grants was rejected as well, and I never heard back from my MP. It did cross my mind when PTO and HDB all rejected my appeal. It crossed my mind to take a bank loan. And that was something that I had sworn not to do. I didn't want to put myself in more debt. And not just the bank loan. I also thought about borrowing money from other family members, from friends. And I thought, this is why people go to loan sharks. It's not about bad character. It's simply desperation. Those few months were a time when I truly felt the most financially insecure in my life. And I know this may come across as such a privileged thing to say because I wasn't in deep debt. I only had my student loan, which was interest-free. I had savings and quite a substantial amount. But realistically, it was not enough. I had to project savings from October, November, December. Basically, I had to project future income and areas where I can save. I had to make decisions based on the assumption that I will have enough money to pay for it in the future. Realistically, I did not have enough money at that moment in September 2020 to make the down payment later on, but I projected that I could with my future income. That felt like a gamble to me, but I didn't think that I had any other choice. At this point, I felt like I had been hit from every possible angle, and so the rest of this journey, at least on the HDB buying process side, it felt like it went a lot smoother compared to everything that I had to go through in September. And so onwards we go, for the rest of the month, I was going for house viewings, I was stalking the property guru page every minute of every day, and I was doing the best I could to move forward. A beautiful thing happened in the month of October, which is also my birthday month. On the 3rd of October, I went to the open house of my future home. From the moment I saw the listing, and when I saw the flat in person, I knew that I needed to get the house, not because it was perfect, it was far from it, but it was just good enough and ticked all the boxes. Although I didn't have many boxes, my requirements were mainly just, number one, it had to be within my budget, 
Number two, not have a long waiting time between exercising my option and submitting the resale application. And number three, not be in absolute ruin. Thankfully, there was also something about the flat that I felt like I could work with and that was the spark. So I told Finn, my real estate agent, and the bidding war began. He was liaising with the seller agent until 1am and we managed to outbid everyone else. The final agreed-upon purchase price for the flat was $256,000. Truthfully, it was more than I had budgeted for, but it was still doable. I obviously had to cut back on the budget I had set aside for renovation, but it was not such a massive strain. And honestly, I was just so relieved that we got the deal at all. Interestingly, I found my home exactly one month after meeting my agent, and I told him this. And it felt so surreal because the entire month of September was so full of obstacles that it felt like a lifetime, but it had only been a month. The next step of the process was to get my option to purchase, or OTP for short, which is essentially a deposit on the house in cash, paid directly to the seller. This deposit is part of your down payment for the house as well. The amount is negotiated between the buyer and the seller and is anywhere between $1 at minimum to $1,000 maximum. This can often be a factor in negotiations as well. Also, at this point, you should have your HLE ready. So on 9 October, I got my OTP and I paid the maximum $1,000 deposit. Within one working day, the buyer must submit a request for valuation. This costs $120 and is non-refundable. The purpose of this request for valuation is for HDB to assess the value of your property, independent of how much you are paying for it. This in turn affects your LTV ratio and the buyer's CPF usage in paying for the property. HDB will send someone to do a physical inspection on the flat, so the seller needs to let the valuer in to assess the property within the next 4 working days. I already knew when I agreed to the purchase price that I was overpaying for the flat. This means that the flat was overvalued. There's a term for it called cash overvaluation or COV and it refers to the difference between the sale price of a resale HDB flat and its actual valuation by HDB. Most importantly, this difference must be paid for in cash and you cannot use CPF for it. If you remember my explanation on the LTV ratio earlier, I also mentioned how this might affect your loan amount. Property Guru has an article if you want to read up more about it, I'll link it in the description. Basically, my flat was valued lower than the resale price we agreed on. I won't declare the exact market value of my flat, but let's say that it was $248,000. If the agreed upon purchase price was $256,000, I would have to pay the difference, which was $8,000 in cash. For those who are thinking of paying for your down payment mostly by CPF, this may affect your decision because you would then have to fork out a significant chunk of cash, but because I was paying mostly in cash, it didn't affect my decision too much. With this understanding and acceptance that my flat is overvalued, I went for another site visit on the 11th of October, which was also my birthday. I turned 24 years old, but emotionally, I felt like a 40-year-old. On 20th October, 10 days after submitting the request, the result of the valuation came out on the HDB portal, which was what we expected. The flat was overvalued and there was a cap on how much money from CPF we could use. But again, I projected that I would only have at most 7 k in my CPF to use anyway, so this didn't affect me too much. So only after the result of the valuation comes out can you then exercise your option to purchase. Between the issuance of your OTP to exercising your OTP, there is a maximum of 21 days which they call the cooling off period for the buyer. If the buyer decides not to go through with the purchase for whatever reason, for example the cash overvaluation could be way too high, they can choose not to exercise their option, but their initial option fee would be forfeited. To exercise your OTP, you pay a minimum of $1, but in total, your option fee plus the payment for exercising your OTP should not exceed $5,000. So $5,000 is the maximum deposit you can pay to the seller. For myself, I paid the maximum for exercising my OTP, which was $4,000. 
so in total, I paid $5,000 as deposit on the house. The next step is, finally, to submit your resale application to HDB. I did this on the 26th of October. The application fee for a 2-room HDB flat and smaller is $40, but for 3-room and above, I believe it's $80. This fee is non-refundable. Also, the buyer and seller must submit their resale application within 7 days of each other or the application will lapse and you have to resubmit and pay the fee again. And then, in 1 to 2 weeks of resale submission, the HDB branch office will go down to inspect the flat. Something to consider here would be the number of days between exercising your OTP and submitting the resale application. The number of days is decided between the seller and the buyer. So the longer you wait, the later your application is processed and the later you get your flat. Technically, the maximum number of days is 90 days because the valuation from HDB on the flat will only be valid for 3 months and you need to submit within that time before your valuation expires. Normally, people will negotiate about 60 days and the reason is typically because the sellers themselves need time to move out and maybe even find a new place and that requires quite a bit of time. So this is something to consider as well if you're getting a resale flat. For myself, the waiting time required was a huge factor in my decision making because any waiting time longer than one month would be a deal breaker for me. Because I was in a huge rush to move out, that was a major priority for me. And that's why I could overlook the fact that it was way overvalued. It was a compromise that I was willing to make. Alright, so moving on. After I submitted my resale application on the 26th of October, I started looking at different interior design firms and sourcing for renovation quotes. I'll make a separate video on the entire renovation process in the future, so please subscribe to my channel if you'd like to know when that video comes out. It's a new month now, it's November, and things are going smoothly, in terms of the process at least. From here on out, we're just playing the waiting game with HDB. So in the meantime, I busied myself with looking at renovation quotes, planning the layout of my home, figuring out what I want the interior design to look like. On the 11th of November, I got this text message from HDB informing me that my resale application has been registered. They also gave me the estimated completion date, which is the day I go down to HDB and collect the keys to my new flat. So HDB already gave me the timeline and a date to look out for. Typically, the completion appointment will be 8 weeks after receiving your letter of acceptance, so this was quite normal. On the 23rd of November, I got another text from HDB saying that my racial documents are ready for endorsement, which means I gotta go into the HDB portal and take a look at them and sign them and also pay the resale fees. This is the fun part where I share the numbers. So I went into the HDB portal and there were quite a few documents that I had to look at. There was also a really detailed financial plan where HDB breaks down all the individual fees and whether it'll be paid by cash or by CPF. To summarize in a simpler table, here are all the payments I had to make. To put it in context, the purchase price of my flat was $256,000. But on top of this purchase price, the additional fees, namely the stamp fees, legal fees, title search fees, and caveat fees, added up to an extra $4,658.80. Please note this is still not all the costs, I'll summarize the total including all the application fees at the end of this section. On 31st December 2020, I received another text from HDB informing me that my resale completion appointment has been confirmed. At this point, you might need to get a fire insurance policy for your flat, depending on whether or not the previous owner still has an existing policy covering the flat. You should check with the seller or your agent. I remember reading in some articles that you may have to present your fire insurance policy on the day of your completion appointment, so just to be safe, I did buy my own fire insurance, and it was only $2.71 for 5 years, so it wasn't a huge deal. I believe FWD is the appointed fire insurer for HDB, so I went with that. Onwards to January 2021, an exciting new year. On the 4th of January, I made an early payment for my agent fees, since I already got the letter from ERA. I had no particular reason for paying it early besides just not wanting to think about it anymore. 
My agent fees were 1% of the purchase price plus GST, which makes it $2,739.20. The next day, on 5th January, I did a final inspection with my agent of the flat. Buyers typically will make one more visit to the flat one to two days before the completion appointment to make sure that the seller has moved everything out of the house and that it will be vacant possession before getting the keys. And the next day after that, on the 6th of January, was my resale completion appointment. My agent and I went down to the HDB branch at Topayo, but he couldn't accompany me inside the building because of safe management measures, so it was just me and the seller, and the agents waited outside. At this appointment, I paid the remaining down payment of $50,300 with my cashier's order, and I got my keys. And that was it. From January to April, it was renovation work, and I moved in in April 2021. That was the entire process of getting my two-room HDB flat from September 2020 to the 6th of January 2021. I have to say, my timeline is unusually compressed at four months. Typically, I believe it would be a lot longer. But with renovation, I only managed to move in in April, so really, the time I decided to move out to when I actually moved into my new flat It was about seven to eight months. To wrap up this chapter of the story with an overview of all the fees and payments I made in this process, I will put up on screen a summary table in chronological order, so please pause here if you want to take a closer look. To accompany that, I'll also have it sorted by category, so you can see the breakdown of the payments. For example, you can see how the payment for the house was broken down. All in all, I paid a total of $65,300, of which $58,400 was in cash and $6,900 was by CPF. With my savings at the time, that left me with a remaining $12,100 approximately in cash. And that is the end of this chapter of the story. Okay. Let's round all this up with some meditation, some reflection on what has happened. First and foremost, I want to discuss the idea of compromise, while we still have all those numbers we just discussed still fresh in our minds. I only did this, this being embarking on the entire journey and process of buying a resale HDB at 24 years old, I only did it because I had no other choice that was acceptable to me. I refused to let my family continue to stay at the current house with my aunt. I also did not want to move in with another relative, which could potentially repeat the same situation all over again. Renting also did not seem wise from a financial point of view. And so, because I had all these considerations, I had to make just as many concessions. I had to be willing to take the financial risk, first of all. I had to be willing to sacrifice all those housing grants, I had to be willing to settle for a two-room HDB even though we're a three-person family, and I had to be willing to take on a 25-year mortgage while still on a 3k a month salary. Were they the wisest financial decisions I could have made? No, obviously, because my considerations were not financial, they were emotional, and I am very aware of that. I could have waited a few more years, I could have endured the unhealthy home environment a bit longer, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to continue to put myself and my mother through that. So I think that this is really the best I could have done at the time. So compromise was a really difficult and painful pill that I had to swallow. It had to happen because we cannot have everything we want the way we want it. I would have loved a three-room flat, but I just couldn't have it. I could cry and moan about everything that is bad and unfair that was happening to me in my life. And I did cry a lot, trust me. But what I believed I couldn't do was give up. I kept telling myself that I didn't have the luxury of letting the anxiety and the difficulty stop me. And while it was a great motivator, it definitely reached a point where it became a really unhealthy mentality because I let myself to believe that somehow or other, my family and I would be ruined if I were to fail at this thing that I had set out to do. I didn't even dare to clarify to myself what this meant, because fear is such a great motivator, and in the back of my mind, I didn't want to lose this motivation, 
and I just carried this fear in my heart around for months. When this was all happening, I could not imagine any kind of future for myself. All I could focus on were the next two steps that I had to take. My life and my foresight became really narrow in that way. And that fear that I carried with me for so long, it didn't just go away when it was all over when I finally moved into my new place. It stayed with me because your body remembers what you've done to it. It took me months before I admitted that I had a problem and started therapy again, and this was long after that high-stress situation had ended. Your body catches up to you, and it can be really ugly when it does. Going back to my unhealthy mindset and my really poor coping skills, if I could tell my younger self something to help her get through this really difficult time, I don't know, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and have the takeaway lesson be something thoughtless like it will all work out in the end because I could not imagine a future, I could only focus on the here and now and the here and now was really painful. So what I think I would tell myself is to focus not just on the task at hand but also on taking care of myself and not let that nebulous fear consume me. Because in this situation, The world will not end, and life will continue, no matter the decision or the outcome. And as long as life continues, I will find another way. A scene from Avatar that came to my mind long after the fact is this particular one. This city is a prison. I don't want to make a life here. Life happens wherever you are, whether you make it or not. Listen to Iroh. Take care of yourself. On that note, I would also tell my younger self to look at the people she has around her, supporting her and helping her. Why did I make myself believe that I was all alone? I mean, yes, at the end of the day, someone had to sign the papers, someone had to go to the bank, someone had to make the phone calls and organize the calendars. But I always had people with me. My friends, my agent, my social worker, even acquaintances. I wanted to validate myself and my feelings of loneliness so much that I only further isolated myself, and that I did that to myself. How could I complain that none of my friends cared about me because nobody was checking in on me or offering their help? How could they because I didn't even tell most of them what I was going through? There is no shame in asking for help and support, and I need to learn that. Finally, to balance out everything that I've said so far, This is not to say that anything can be done with willpower or determination by oneself. There are a lot of social inequalities and systemic barriers in place that really work to hinder people. Inflexible systems and policies that favour a certain type of family unit, citizenship qualifications, all of these shouldn't be ignored. And even though I met with many of these barriers, I still felt like I had some privilege and that there were others who were even less privileged than me. Because ultimately, I still had savings, I had my father's CPF money, I had a job, and all of this contributed to my success of acquiring a home at the end of the day. So, I hope something changes. It's incredibly demoralizing to see how little your country's policies think about you or work to support you. And that's all I will say on the matter. With that, I will close this video here. If you've watched this far, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. It was a cathartic experience for me to work on this, and I also hope there was something from this video that will be of help to you. I've included my email in the description box, so please feel free to reach out if you're in a similar situation or if you have any questions, and I'll do my best to help if I can. I would like to make a part 2 to this series to continue the story where it left off, where I discuss in greater detail the renovation and moving process. I think it will be a good follow-up because the journey didn't end with me just collecting my keys. If you like this video, I hope you stick around and subscribe. I make content about personal finance and life as a young adult in Singapore trying to figure it out. Thank you so much again and I hope you take care of yourself.